Our scripture passage this morning comes from the second chapter of the book of Haggai. Listen here and receive God's word. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai saying, speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people and say, who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Zehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you. Let me read that again. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once again in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now the passage that I just read from the prophet Haggai was actually last Sunday's le lectionary reading. Passages from Haggai only come up in the lectionary rotation about once every three years. You see, Haggai is considered a minor prophet, and his prophecy is contained in two small chapters. By all indication, Haggai only prophesied four short months. His short tenure prophesying to God's people proves the point that short as well as long tenures in service to God and God's people can be and are impactful and serve a purpose. Haggai's message was counter to other prophets. One commentator writes that among all the prophets of Israel, Haggai is unique for his insistence on temple building. Isaiah proclaimed that the Lord of hosts hated the superficial worship carried on in the temple. And Jeremiah labeled the sanctuary a den, a hiding place of robbers, because the Judeans thought they could worship God without reforming their lives. So for Haggai to urge the rebuilding of the temple, it was contradictory to others. Haggai also differed from the prophets in other ways. He did not issue a cry for social justice, nor did he assure the contrite or the lowly that God dwells with them. Haggai would not have lasted a week preaching to God's people at ELPC. <laughs> in the first chapter of Haggai, God's covenant people are back in their beloved homeland after being exiled for 70 years, but all is not well. Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest in Jerusalem, lived in paneled houses while God's house was still in ruins. And due to drought and inflation in the land, the people were hungry, they were thirsty, financially destitute, and they were wearing worn clothes. The Israelites, they were home, but home was a different place, completely destroyed and unrecognizable by those who lived there before. In reality, only a remnant of the original Israelites returned to Jerusalem. Almost three generations were born while they were exiled. The majority of the people who returned to Jerusalem, they were very young when they left or had not been born at all. So their memories of what used to be more than likely were based on stories passed down from generation to generation. Stories about how wonderful everything was before. Haggai instructs the people, go up to the hills and bring wood and build houses so that God may take pleasure in it and be honored. 
Now, according to Ezekiel, the people of God got busy. They got busy for about three weeks. And then they grew weary, remembering the magnificence, the grandeur, and the opulence of the temple built by Solomon. The pre-exilic temple was the place where the covenant people gathered as community to worship God. It was the place where the people perceived God's presence, spirit, and glory, and it was the locus of their lives. The temple was essential. Their attempt at temple building did not measure up or compare. Now, I want to share a secret with you. I'll don't tell anybody. <clears throat> I have reached the age and time in my life when I not only think about, <coughs> excuse me, but I also share stories about the wonderful good old days. I remember the days of my youth and young adult life, how magical, carefree, and promising those days were. And then when I'm honest with myself, I remember that there were some bumps in the road. There were some devastating losses and some unexpected side trips along the way. I think I can state um, that we all tend to romanticize the past. The Israelites' memories of their past was a little romanticized, too. You see, if all had been well in the days before their exile, why did God allow them to be overtaken and captured by their enemies? In reality, all was not well in the land of Judah. The Israelites were not living as God's covenant people. They were not acting justly. They were not loving mercifully. They were not walking humbly with God. So in the sight of God, the good old days really weren't all that good. Haggai encouraged and challenged the people to be about God's business now. Eighteen years had elapsed since they returned to their beloved land, and their God-assigned project was still in progress. The temple was incomplete. In the pe people's estimation, the current structure as it stood was shabby and structurally unstable. And according to Nehemiah, it was so rickety that the bump of an animal would dis demolish it. The people were disappointed and sad about their temple rebuilding project. That may very well be the reason that they became distracted, apathetic, self-focused, and abandoned their God-ordained mission, put the kingdom work on the back burner and focused on their personal homes and lives instead. Perhaps the Israelites' apathy was precipitated by their disappointment that the temple was not as grand as Solomon's. Perhaps their apathy was precipitated by their perceived need to secure their own personal lives first. Perhaps their apathy was precipitated by the fact that now that they were home, their priorities had changed. Whatever the reason, Haggai queried, who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight nothing? Commentator Will Gaffney writes, God has not compared their labor with that of their ancestors and found it lacking. God knows that they are feeling insecure about the temple they have recreated for God. Most importantly, though, God is with them, temple or no temple, end of quote. Beloved, it is not about the physical structure or who was or was not in the building. It was tantamount that God's majesty and glorious spirit filled the temple and the people. EOPC, our place of worship is grand and it is glorious. Our steeple rises high into the air as a beacon of hope, love, grace, and godliness. We have made large investments in the reconstruction and upkeep of this building that it might be a place of worship and sanctuary for all of God's people. And we gather here weekly to worship the God who has kept this congregation for more than 200 years. Now, it is human nature for us to remember past times, people, places, and experiences. They are all, they were all formative. They shaped us into who we are today and set us on the trajectory of our lives. Yet we cannot stay there. 
To fully live into who we are created to be requires that we live in the present. Live in the present and grow and be open to change and to seek transformation and to know beyond a shadow of doubt that God is with us in every season. Through every trial and tribulation, God is with us. In times of celebration and joy, God is with us. Gaffney continues, God was with the Israelites in the glorious days of the United Monarchy. God was with the Israelites on both sides of the border when the nation fractured, even though the Judeans claimed that God was with them and not the northern Israelites. God was with the deported and resettled. God was with the Judeans and the Jerusalemites when the Babylonian war machine leveled their temple and obliterated their government. God went with the Judean Israelites into exile and remained with the poorest people of the land who were left behind, end of quote. Our place of worship has not been leveled. It is not in shambles. Yet it sometimes seems that our commitment to serving, to service, is waning. Yesterday, hundreds of people representing 17 Christian churches and denominations, service groups, and organizations gathered at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary to prepare 100,000 packages of soup for our food insecure neighbors and community. Now, I'm not talking about taking a can of soup and placing it into a box. We literally packaged soup from the ingredients. It was a joy serving with God's people yesterday. It was a joy knowing that our food insecure neighbors might have a warm meal out of the efforts that were put forth yesterday. And it was a joy for me serving with a few, a very few of our members. You see, our representation yesterday was not as I anticipated or expected it to be. Beloved, we have been held captive by illness, disease, and death. We have been held captive by a slowing economy, isolation, and loss. We have experienced leadership and staff changes. We have experienced members who are waiting to see who or what is next. And we have experienced economic downturns and high inflation. Those things are real. Yet it's not time for us to stop being the people of God. It is time for us to faithfully live into our commitment to being a Matthew 25 congregation. And in the words of Jesus, we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded us. And we are to remember, remember that I am is with us always to the end of the age. Some of us lament, we lament that worship meetings and gatherings are not the same. Realistically, our giving has decreased and the economy is bad and inflation is astronomically high. Some of the people we are used to seeing in the pews have disappeared. Others are unable to come to worship because their health is fragile. Some have taken a wait and see attitude. <laughs> How can we continue to live into who God has called us to be when everything is different? Everything has changed. A lot is unfamiliar. Well, just as Haggai assured the covenant people of God, we are assured that although people, the economy, the mode of worship and work have all changed, God has not changed. God is faithful and God is still with us. 
and God's message to the discouraged, the disillusioned, and the distracted people of Israel is, and it's to us today, take heart. It consoles. Work. It instructs. I am with you. It assures. The treasures of all nations shall come. It provides and it promises. I will fill this house with splendor. Commentator Timothy Simpson writes, Haggai does not sugarcoat his words to make the message more palatable, nor does he dispute the memory of those who had seen and experienced the first temple. Haggai shifts the people's gaze to the future, moving beyond their present sensory experience of the building before them into an eschatological vision of what God will yet accomplish, declaring that the latter splendor of this place will be greater than its former. Hallelujah! Beloved, what is to come is greater than the former. Now that's a word for us today. We may not believe it, we may not be able to recognize it, and some of us may not live to experience it, but what God has in store is greater than what has been. I stopped by this morning to remind us that God's ways are not our ways, that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We often fall short of being able to understand or perceive what God is doing. And, and as a people of faith, we know that all things work together for good to those or for those who love the Lord and are called according to God's purpose. So do not be discouraged with the present circumstances of our personal, professional, or even our sacred lives. God is with us leading, guiding, providing, and protecting. God has promised to never leave nor forsake us, and God's word confirms that what lies behind <laughs> cannot compare to what lies ahead. It's greater. So be encouraged. Get to work. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Visit the sick and incarcerated. Walk with the disenfranchised and the oppressed. Stand for what is just and righteous. Continue to live confidently in abundance, not in scarcity. Give of your time, talent, and treasures. And praise God in season and out of season. And know beyond any doubt, we serve a great gracious and merciful God and greater is the God that is within us than anything that is in the world EOPC prepare for greater prepare for greater prepare for greater for our God has already prepared greatness for us. May it be so. Amen.